want to be recorded. Now is your warning. Well, okay, the warning's already gone. Uh, welcome, everybody, to another instance of the Chaos OSPO Working Group. Uh, I am Gary White. I will be your facilitator today. So let's get started by going to the first agenda item, looking for someone to be a guest on a podcast about the Organizational Participation Practitioner Guide. Yeah, so that's that's me. So we, we've done podcasts for the Responsiveness Practitioner Guide and for the Contributor Sustainability Guide. So the Contributor Sustainability Guide one, I think, I think that one should go out um, probably in two weeks. Uh, Elizabeth Barron and I did that one. Awesome. Uh, and, and so what I was looking for was maybe, maybe some, so Elizabeth and I did the contributor one. Uh, Luis Canyes Diaz from uh, Baturgia and I did the responsiveness one. So we were thinking maybe there was somebody uh, from an OSPO who has spent a lot of time thinking about how to get more people from different organizations involved in open source projects who might want to come and talk about uh, some of the stuff that we have in the guide. That was the fishing line going into the water. Anybody, any biters, anybody who is interested in that topic that would like to participate. Now is your chance to be chaos cast famous. Yeah. All right. I'm not going to make, I'm not going to make somebody do it. <laughs> yeah. Even though, you I know, would... I, I probably could. Uh, yes. Chaos cast up. has seen enough of me. So somebody else has to do it. <clears throat> All right. I, I will keep reaching out to people and see if I can recruit somebody. But I thought I, I thought I would ask to see if if anyone was interested. Yeah, I think um, maybe also as the guide uh, gets an opportunity to get use, uh, folks might um, be able to show some longer term results, right? Of I did this a year ago and it looks great, or three months ago or whatever. That'd be fun. Little Oops, check ins. Sorry, I'm trying to I'm trying to rearrange stuff on the agenda and I'm failing. That's okay. Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of agenda action right now, so <laughs> it's like watching live editing. All right, sorry, I messed up. Yeah, thanks. I messed up your indenting. I that's all right. Two people from the CMS OSPO that maybe we would do that one next. All right, CMS OSPO, you're up next. There's some updates that you'd like to share. Yes. So. Uh... We have an officially official .gov URL for our open source program office now. Woohoo! That's uh, awesome. That's .gov. Uh, we uh, are updating it. Uh, I'm working on getting the permissions to keep it updated on a regular basis. But uh, right now, we've got an initial version. It's going well. And you can find the latest news and our GitHub repos and our contact info and all that sort of stuff there. Uh, in addition, into that, uh, we have released an early public draft of our XZ vulnerability report. Our very own Isaac Malarski, who has been a chaos member for a long time, uh, put together and drafted a great sort of overall synopsis for our internal audiences. And then we figured, why not also share it with the open source community? So uh, that is available in a repo called OSPO Guide. Uh, that repo is super under construction. Let's go ahead and call it like, you know, pre-alpha, <clears throat> but that is the anticipated place where we will be sharing our open source program office resources with the agency and with the wider world. So lots of action in Webland for the OSPO at CMS. And I will pass it back to our moderator, Gary. Thanks for those updates. Those are exciting. I know uh, supply chain attack, that XC thing, that's going to be hugely helpful just as a public resource. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, that's um, great. Do you have any questions for Remy? Oh, yeah. Any comments, any questions, any feelings? Now's the time. Um, I'm reading about the XC supply chain attack. And it's distracted. the best article you've ever read, right, Sean? It's really, it's very interesting. There are some things I didn't know. Awesome. There's your plug. Go read it. It's great. Anything else for Remy while we have him? 
And of course, you know, patches are welcome if there's something we missed or there's a reference or a resource that you think we should include. By all means, you know, tag us, drop us a line in Slack or, or open an issue on the repo, add a discussion. Uh, we are excited to include resources from the OSPO community here at Chaos. Sounds great. Leave comments, leave issues, contribute, do the open source thing. Speaking of open source, our next item, opensource.microsoft.blog. Things yeah, we so, learned. So I actually added this one. Um, I know nobody from the Microsoft OSPO is on right now, um, but I thought it was, I thought it was a really interesting, I thought it was a really interesting article um, that they've written about what they've, what they've learned. Um, also, before I start this, there are a few more spots on the agenda. So if you ha have anything else that you think of that you want to talk about, go ahead and add it while we work through this, this agenda item. Um, because we do, we're going to have plenty, plenty of time. Um, but I thought it was, I thought it was interesting. So they, uh, they use some of our metrics for sustainability, um, during the, the process, but I thought it was, it was interesting. Some, of some of their, some of their learnings. So they, um, they are very focused on dependency and sustainability, which I think is a, a great focus for a company when it comes to funding some open source projects. So I, I found that, uh, that really interesting. Um, setting better criteria for, um, for the projects was also something that was really helpful for them in, in this round, uh, which I thought was, was also was also really, um, really good. Um, they can only, they only do this for projects and people that can accept GitHub sponsors. Um, so I also thought that that was interesting and I was curious why that was um, because it was something that, that came up in a conversation that, uh, that we had with them. And this is what I, this is what I didn't realize is that it's, um, for them, it's a single invoice. So they can do this whole round of funding and they funded a whole bunch of projects at once. And the reason that this is easy for them is it all goes out as a single invoice. So they don't have to worry about doing bits and pieces, which is really, really hard for, for companies. I know when I worked at VMware, like it's, it's just impossible to do small amounts of, of funding to individual people. But being able to do it as a single invoice was interesting. Like I, I didn't, I didn't realize, didn't realize that. Um, they're also looking for for more uh, metadata for some of their decision making, uh, which is uh, which is interesting. And then the the funding amounts was also was also interesting. So it looks like they ranged from um, $1,000 to $12,500, which is a which is a huge range for projects. But I, I really love seeing companies um, really do things like this and, and fund those projects that are important to them as an organization. So I'll admit Absolutely. I don't have a lot of context about this outside of what they wrote in their blog post. Um, but I was I just found this blog post really, really fascinating. It seems to be one of them the approaches. Well, this is one of the things that I've been discussing here and there. Uh, because um, I should have introduced myself to uh, before that. So my name is Jadar Bolishbo. I'm from Portugal, where I'm the, the board, the, the chair of the, the board of the Open Source Business Alliance here. Um, one of the things that I've been trying to conjure and prepare is the idea of a, of a national fund to support uh, communities, uh, open source and related. And one of the approaches is actually very close to, to that thing of um, there's only one invoice because the idea is if, if you have a if you have a fund you have an entity that receives uh, um, it's a sponsors well um, supporters 
that somehow, for instance, they uh, say, okay, we're going to give 10,000 to the fund, uh, but beforehand we want that, for instance, 5,000 are going to Apache. Okay. And the rest goes into a common fund. And then you have uh, a sort of a donors committee that periodically decides where to give the certain amount, uh, which is a little bit of a, a copied from what I've seen uh, in terms of um, uh, relief support for certain catastrophes where they, you have a, a donor fund, they convene uh, every so often, and they have a list of requests. We have to rebuild the bridge, we have to supply um, food to this and this and this community. And so they have a list of things and they decide to give that money or more than that money to those projects. Um, and everyone has a, has a vote, but basically they are drawing from, the, from that fund. Once the, the money they have given any purpose of the fund is exhausted, they, they no longer have a, a seat there. Um, and so the thing is, in terms of counting wise, in terms of transfer of money, that was done once, period. And then it is distributed as, as you receive uh, requests. So in this case of GitHub, they, the thing is they handle all of this uh, automatically. Um, and in case of the, um, and what I've seen, it was, I think it was Software Conservancy or Open Collective. The way they do it is a little bit different. And I think it's more of a, of a burden on the, the, the organization. So uh, one of them, uh, OC or SF, um, they have to devote a large amount of uh, time just to allocate funds and do those things which, uh, well, it, it gets a, a large stress on them. Um, and I think, which is now demonstrated on this thing from Microsoft, uh, if you can automate as much as possible, then on the corporate side, so on the decision side of where to bring money, the, the question is much simpler. We are giving money X. And so the one that signs the checks has only to be bothered once. And then you have other people that deal with, well, choosing and allocating things uh, according to well, other criteria, but it's, uh, the money is no longer there on the, on the issues. Uh, is the project valid to receive that money or not? So that's, um, that's very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I thought that the scale of this is is pretty interesting. So it was 175 mm -hmm. open source projects. So this was not mm -hmm. this is not just a few projects, which is yeah. which is typically what what I see in in other you know other funding sources. Um, and yes. it's it, I really I don't know I I really like that this has been a bigger focus for a lot of organizations. So. Um, you know, I, I do some work with the Sovereign Tech Fund in Germany, and they're um, giving funding to infra important infrastructure projects. And there are, you know, other other programs through some of the grant funding agencies who are are giving funding to some of these important important infrastructure projects or important projects that that we use. Mm -hmm. So I think it's I think it's nice to see see that mix between some of the like nonprofit and grant funding organizations and also on the, on the corporate side. And I, I'm seeing here the spread of the, the, the amounts they are giving, which is more or, more or less in line what I've been witnessing here with different communities. Most communities don't need much in terms of sponsoring. Sometimes, for instance, they need a, some to pay to someone to clean up the room after they make the, the meeting or to buy a new laptop so they can project the, the session or 
to buy, well, small things usually. And, um, and in terms of projects, well, that varies widely. When you're talking to projects, that's, that is more complex because then you have uh, the guys that say, okay, I can no longer do this because I need money and, um, and I'm not. I'm not earning enough just to, to, mm -hmm. to go there, but that's a completely different topic. Let's not go there because it's uh, complex to discuss uh, here in the open. I'd like to... Oh, go ahead. No, just just say, I, I, I'd like to bring here, I'll still have to write this down, but there is uh, something it's not close to the ZX uh, supply chain attack, but it's it's <laughs> relatively close, which is um, uh, distribution maintainer decided that uh, a certain security product was not well designed, and so it changed. It wasn't that one. So it changed the product, so it no longer works as the rest of the users uh, are expected. Um, and, uh, but I have to, to, this analysis to write down. Uh, but it's a sort of a, it's a, a well-intentioned supply chain attack because basically the product became unusable for the 99.9% .9 of all users. It only caters for that particular user that happens to be the distribution maintainer. Um, but um, it's also an interesting thing that has to be taken into account. Yeah, that's an interesting scenario that I think community health metrics play into, right? Like, yep. I'd love to see, you mentioned that you might want to write a report about this. If you want some ideas on like what health metrics chaos uses, uh, we have all those metrics stood up and uh, it would be great to see references to like maybe you could tell if we were tracking this a little more closely you could you could uh, correct for that variable okay let's see what i can do no promises um <laughs> although course, i'm organizing two events in october so it would be nice to have something to talk about um, yeah absolutely but, well, th um, this group's great for that. If if you write something up and you want some feedback on how it might relate, I mean, bring it here. And then bash, I'll read it. Bash, on, bash me all you want. Um, <laughs> I'll try to do this. Uh, so I think I'm on this uh, Slack. Mm -hmm. In the, yes, I'm there. Um, uh, so I'll be thinking once I have, well, something written down. Uh, that's um, that's readable by human yeah. people, not yeah. just by engineers. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Okay. And um, I, I totally agree with the idea that the sponsoring piece is like just such a, a maze of how to get it done in a huge organization. So it's encouraging to see big companies do it in a way that shows some of the warts and some of the things that you can avoid. I thought that was great. Have uh, I have it. like the tiniest mini agenda item that, that I talked to Sean about a couple days ago. Um, my, my difficulties with Augur have compelled me to um, try to build something that's just like a single purpose uh, metric collector um, for viability metrics specifically. And so I'm taking a lot of inspiration from how Augur does things with regards to how it collects. Uh, I plan to use a similar Postgres backing, but with some technologies that weren't around when Augur uh, started that allow me to do more like extract transform load architecture. And my hope is that I'll be able to generate a single executable that will have some dependencies, but maybe Docker would make that easier too, that I want to know what the viability of this is. Please collect that for me, and this tool will collect that, those metrics and spit out the numbers that you want to see. Um, that's like my really base pitch 
that I'll put in this meeting now uh, and then give you updates on as I actually have something to report. I got pretty far pretty quick. I got further than I thought I would in the time that I've had to work on it. So I hope to have more interesting and exciting things to report as, as I get further with it. Yeah, Gary, uh, I'd like to comment on that for, for a bit. Like, like we've talked uh, uh, just in terms of like the Augur team a lot about like splitting up collection and like a lot of like other things just into their own like either Python like packages or projects of their own just mm -hmm. because like that's a much better way of doing things, I think. Um, so yeah, I, I think that you're uh, barking up the right tree um, and that like, if we can do things like we have various like tasks and, and uh, that we do in terms of collection, if we can get to a point where like, oh, we use uh, a tool that, that like this or similar to this um, as like a dependency and, and we can like factor out that code into its own thing, that might be a more desirable pattern. Although this is still, we're, we're still talking early stages. We would need to plan it out. Yeah. And discuss. Yeah. Like, like Gary and I discussed, um, you know, Augur is a big boat to steer. And I think if Gary, you know, I think one of the nice parts about the way it's licensed is you can look into the guts, figure out what we do and yep. make a lighter weight version of it. Like we basically made a decision to put everything everywhere all at once. And, <laughs> you know, it's uh, it has some imperfections that I think, you know, I think Gary could uh, go about perhaps making some more accessible tools for the community. Yeah, like, and, uh, I think Oh, sorry, Sean. No, you go ahead, Isaac. Yeah, I think that like most collection tasks should be like, because we have a bunch of patterns that are like, oh, collect OFFF metrics or oh, collect SCC metrics. And it's literally just like, oh, we use this external command line tool and, yeah. and save. Like, like that's what, that, that's the ideal collection task is, is we're just providing the database schema and architecture uh, like, on an existing tool that, that calculates that. And, and it's not, you know, it, it's it's complicated, but but um, that's really how Python application applications should be built. Um, the, the, the pattern of like building it like a Java application is simply unsustainable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. It's something that I've, it's something that I've toyed with for the starter project health metrics model because the idea is that the starter project health metrics model is designed to get people started. Well, to get people started, to have them install Augur as, as the place where you can run the starter project health metrics model tools that I've built is, is a big ask. And so I, I did kind of think about doing Gary, what you're doing and then, you know, time, I never, I never actually really started it in earnest. So I would be curious to to learn from from what you did and see. Well, I'm actually thinking that a lot of my starter project health metrics model are also in the viability models. So there yeah, might be, I'd, there I'd might love be to trade some DMs about that because I think uh, dot dot dot. There are things that I I won't get into in this forum that yeah. motivate me to have this available as a chaos tool, not a Horizon uh, or Gary tool. Yeah. No, that would be great. I would I would love to see something like this as a as a chaos tool where we have we have something simple that we can that people can use to get started. Because I think, you know, on the one hand, if people start with something simpler and they can really get started and really see the value in doing this work, that I think a lot of people will then move on to Augur or Grimoire Lab later. Yes. Because they see the value of it. But it's really hard right now where to see the value of it is the, the barrier to entry is so high right now. Yeah, and, and, and I, 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 as a true believer, uh, I have been using <laughs> chaos metrics and, and tools in my job since two jobs ago. Like mm -hmm. I very much know the values there. I can pitch it, I know the good talking points to get my leadership bought in on it, but then you get in a restrictive environment like what I'm working with in, at Verizon, there's a lot of restrictive environments at plenty of companies. And there's just these edge cases that you have to work around and do so much maintenance tasks to keep those working that it becomes really difficult to like maintain or show the value in the first place. But if you can get easy numbers, here's 
what here's the value that we can get. By the way, they, they have this much more heavyweight tool for all the other things and other data we want to collect. I, yeah. I think that could be very compelling. Interesting. Uh, Gerardo, Gerardo, you said you had a... Yes. Yeah. So do be disturbing all of... Again, um, just to, to make sure if I understand. So that's the tool you use to basically score a certain company or project according to the metrics you already defined. Am I right? Oh, um, it's, it's focused on particularly a project. Uh, you mentioned organizations and that is not in scope of, I think, the metrics that I care about, at least for the purposes of viability. I'm not familiar enough with the starter health metrics to tell you whether or not that has organizational influence catalog there, but I know um, Augur and Grimoire do provide levers to say this organization has such and such community health across all of their um, projects. Uh, the, the What I'm talking about is, is a very like singular purpose trying to gather viability based metrics that could absolutely expand into a framework that works to collect more things. Um, but I'm, I'm building with the focus of making it simple to collect these metrics and get actionable results about those projects. Um, because that's something that I think is, is missing from the current installations, uh, just from a maintenance perspective and a setup perspective. Just one thing, it is an automated collection tool. It's, it's, I'm here looking at the docs. It gets information about activity on Git. There's nothing user, uh, of user inputs. Are you talking about Augur or are you talking about what yes. Gary is building? Uh, I'm talking about Augur as my reference point. John, I think you would be the best to comment on Augur's design functionality. I mean, it's, it's design. It's uh, kind of like an all-consuming tool set. So it's, it's intended to gather all of the data that you would need to uh, generate uh, every chaos metric. And uh, because it has that large scope, it also, I think, as anyone who's tried to install it has experienced, it can be kind of unmanageable. So it would be better. Uh, you know, I like the idea. I like the road that Gary's going down. I think, I think now is a good time in the life cycle of the chaos project and understanding open source health more broadly to think in these, these more tightly scoped tools to think in those in those mindsets into Isaac's earlier point, when we have lightweight tools that go get specific metrics, then those can always be wrapped up in something like Augur uh, to be okay. presented in a shared schema. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, like, uh, um, okay, I think I understand. Uh, yeah, I want to uh, jump off of what like, John's talking about. But, like, just in terms of like how Augur is designed right now, I think there's some pollution. And Remy's hand is up, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, think I, I mentioned in chat, I just want to finish okay. this thing before we get there. Yep. Yeah, like just in terms of like how it's designed, like it's designed to gather all of the metrics all at once. So like, mm -hmm. reason why, that's the why it's so hard to install because you have to have Reddit rather than queue and you have to put your Git credentials because it does like local Git metrics as well as like querying the, the GitHub like API and stuff. So like in terms like of like that. wanting it to be more, oh yeah, sorry, what? It, it looks like the, the kind of uh, applications that I work with, enterprisey things, and so they are large and worldly and takes months to put it on. Um, I, I was just here trying to draw parallels with another initiative, which is also trying to, not, a, not trying to get metrics, but as much as um, define a score of, um, governability, which is the GG, my GGI board, which is basically a, a sort of a manual questionnaire where you go in, in terms of management saying, okay, do you have license? Do you have procedures for so and so and so? 
in terms of managing open source projects. And so it gives you more or less a score on showing things. So it's a completely different thing, but it seems to be touching some of the the things that Augur and Gary were talking about. Uh, parallel universes, um, different approaches, but mm -hmm. um, that yeah. is something that I'm trying to bridge the, yeah. those two worlds. Yeah. Also, yeah. Uh, Isaac, just before you jump in, I, I want to say this is the earliest stage I could have talked about this. I, I started writing something that is currently collecting from a GitHub API and synthesizing a result, but it's not at, it's not something I would show to anybody or even put in git, git commit history at this point. So everything I say is like the fantastical idea of what I want it to be. Uh, Augur is a functioning tool that actually gets your metrics today. Um, I just I just want to put that caveat on everything I'm saying is is that I I don't have to deal with reality yet. Yeah, jumping off what 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 you Gary and, and Geraldo are saying, like in terms in terms of like the use cases of Augur, it seems like there's a lot of people that want like very specific results and metrics about very specific things. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of the priorities of Augur, it's very much like the top priority is um, getting everything collected. Uh, so like the the, the top priority is doing like everything, getting everything done. It's very breadth focused, not depth focused. So if someone's like, oh, I only want, I only want to check if there are readmes in my project, um, then we would want to do something like use a tool like upstream that does that. And then they wouldn't use Augur, they would use the upstream tool. I have to say most of the customers I have oh. will fail miserably on all those methods. I don't. <laughs> they are large corporations. Yeah, yeah. and and m most projects don't Dang. reach what would maybe Dang. be optimal metrics. Okay. But knowing where you sit in that middle ground between probable failure and likely okayness, that's a big gray area <laughs> that we gather these <laughs> metrics around. Yep. All right, Remy. You've been waiting so patiently, please. And oh, sorry, yeah. before yeah, that, no, Gerardo, no, can you no, mute no. when you're not talking? Because we're right. getting some background noise. Thanks. Sorry, go, Remy. All good. So yeah, um, I hear you early days. Um, as someone who also deals with the pain of infrastructure standing up and maintenance here in the government space, anything that doesn't require an API or a running service is definitely a tool that we like very much. Uh, we have had a lot of success with tools like SCC to do some of our like very basic metric stuff. But if we could be at like the repo level where it's like using Git instead of GitHub, so we can generate those kinds of metrics from Git and then store that in something that doesn't necessarily require a running database, or if you wanted to then run a database and dump it into it, that would be cool. That would be a pattern that would lend itself a little easier for us just because getting budget is like a Congress thing and that, that is harder to do than <laughs> asking manager. So Whoa, whoa, um, you don't wanna you don't wanna go in front of the house and be like, I can has five hundred dollars for Postgres? <laughs> turns out. Turns out. Okay. I mean you know, it's uh, open source. Why do you need money for that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, just thought I would throw my, you know, uh, a fantastical wish list requirements um, into the ether as well. I, yeah. I'm very enthused to hear that because part of the input and output is that I want this to be accessible. Um, I think there's a, a there's an argument to be made about database options being built in from the get go. Uh, those database options, including JSONL and including um, p .pg dumps, if I can figure out what that format would look like, et cetera. Yeah, and there are some of these metrics and 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 information that that, that we have in Augur that just can't be done without like the the larger collection aspect. Like like some one of this uh, like like the, um, is our contributor resolution in Augur. Like we we use a. Uh, um, a heavily modified version of this old tool uh, called facade and like you can just use that tool i'm pretty sure it still exists 
um but like because of like how it interfaces with the, with the the database schema and the other parts of like augur like, like it integrates with like all the other platforms it, it maps like uh get, get github contributors and police platform contributors to like the actual emails that show up in the git id and like stuff like that you just can't have in like just a simple command line tool at least not in the way that we've done it because like we were heavily relying on this post script yeah just um Sorry. i've been putting some stuff in chat but the using these smaller scale discrete tools also scales a lot more reliably i think like one of the reasons that augers become complex and has this queuing system is because we are really literally getting if you look at the schema all the data that you might ever ask a question of and to do that uh, there's a ton of platform api calls as well as navigation of the git logs and running of these external tools and it's just it basically becomes a coordination problem an orchestration problem and if we're just running a discrete tool to gather a specific metric then all of that scheduling and ordering complexity is removed and i could just like run a tool against a hundred thousand repos and give me the results yeah, that's so, doable um but a lot of the information like like has to come from an api or, or an endpoint of some kind and like yeah you, you kind of can't speed that up like that's why we use python it's the slow language because the endpoints are slow yeah or files some information it's only on files and this is all what makes Augur so powerful, right? And it's it's what makes it such an a uh, such an amazing tool is that it, it does have all of this stuff in a, in a pretty fast Postgres database on the on the back end. It's just it's just getting people started with with some of these metrics. Well, it, it's like maybe Augur is not a, a good starting point because like Augur is for people that want to collect everything. Mm -hmm. Like that's <laughs> that's what it's for. And if you're like, oh yeah, I want to get started with metrics, I'm going to try to collect everything all at once. Yeah, it, it, uh, it's on, on my exactly. Windows. hundred percent of the labor where you're only using thirty percent of the metrics feels really yeah. bad. Yeah, it's not. It's not great. Yep. All right. Um, that's that's my small interjection that took up twenty minutes of the meeting. <laughs> that was a really interesting conversation, though. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, sorry, I, I had a lot to say about it. That's no, not a bad great. thing. Thanks, Isaac. OK, uh, replace with your agenda item here. And then reminders uh, for the OSS researchers. Uh, Don, I'll let you do these. I, I assume you yeah, know yeah. more about Yeah, I, I added the reminders. Um, so the Open Forum Europe is holding their second annual Open Forum Academy in November at Harvard. The CFP is open uh, now, so it's open until August 7th. And I went to this last year in Berlin, and it was a really nice event um, because it did. So OFE historically has been really strong on the policy side. And this event is really interesting because they bring that policy stuff to bear, but also with a focus on research and then also bringing practitioners into the mix. So it was it was a really interesting mix of policy practice and and research and so i found it i found it really interesting so i would say that for anybody who's doing interesting research on open source software that this would be a good place to submit it especially if you're interested in that intersection of of policy and practice uh gerardo um related to to this which is uh i now um, entering the rabbit hole of the OSPRO ref the, the um, reference groups in Zotero world, and there are quite a few on OSPRO and open source um, uh, research. I'm just uh, wondering if uh, any of you are maintaining any of them. Um, I'll, uh, this is also because I'm trying to share as much information um, and so not only papers, but uh, press articles and projects in a somewhat um, coherent um, uh, way. And Zotero so far, it's the one I found it's easier because then you can manage bibliographic references that you're, you're writing papers you need to. Uh, Sean. Um, just responding to Gerardo, 
I have a, I put it in chat too. I have a ton. I think the, the like I'm, I haven't shared them for any other reason than I have so many and they're organized in my own idiosyncratic way, not really for uh, public consumption. Uh, but I'm happy to share what I have. I just feel like it would be like dumping all of my crap on the front porch. <laughs> But we are we are working on a couple of things related to this right now. Um, so the if you look at the practitioner guides, there are some research sources cited in each one of those, and they're um, they're very much kind of foundational things about uh, open source projects. So some of those might be might be interesting. The other thing that we're going to do in the fall. So Matt German Prey, who's on vacation this week. He is, he has a student who's starting in the fall, who's going to go through all of our metrics and um, help us add references to them because a lot of them do have basis in academic research. A lot of them do have, you know, things that, that support the, you know, provide some academic support for some of the things that we talk about. So that's not going to happen until the fall, but we will eventually, hopefully have citations for most of our metrics so it doesn't help yeah. you right now uh necessarily no but we're working but on it's, it it's the starting point yeah it, this is all started because i started uh, following um Vicky Bresser, uh, with uh, which has she has a library of uh, small library of references i suppose she has many more behind on their own private repo and um, but, but I now I now have 5,000 references, 14,000 bookmarks, and I don't know how many. I'm trying to get the sense of out of it. So I think it happens to a lot of us. If, uh, if anyone, or, you know, Gerardo, if you or anyone has particularly like scoped questions about what, what's been written, I, I think that's easier to share um then the re you know some like a broadly construed reference related to open source project health because that's such a wide such a wide berth there but but any kind of a narrower question i think it would be easier for me to just take for me personally to take stuff i have and and just find the things that fit in some question category and share that um yeah, and okay, I think, I think too, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the spot, Sean, just a little bit. But Gerardo, I think also one of the things that you might try doing is searching for um, you know, Google Scholar or whatever for a couple of the people who tend to do a lot of research from the Chaos Project. So you can search for Sean Goggins and you're gonna get some some interesting things about Project Health. Matt German Prey would be another one. Uh, Daniel Izquierdo would be um, another one, and there are certainly people I'm I'm forgetting, but um, I think Georg, Georg, uh, Kevin Lombard. Also, I think most of his papers are co-authored with one of the others. So I think once you find some of those, but but that might be a good starting point. I mean, that's kind of how I always approach academic research: is if I get a couple of really good papers. And then they cite other good papers, and then I end up down this rabbit hole of citations of citations of citations, and then I end up with more than I can read. But um, it might be it might be a good starting point. I'd, I'd start with those those few names. Okay, that's nice. Um, I'm also trying to, to establish here a, at least a small group of researchers here in Portugal, which have been doing some some work on this and. Uh, with their help, trying to, to figure out some some way of um, of mutually agreed classification for those references in a shared repo. repo. Uh, I shall come back here once we have something I can point you to, so that you can also go there and check if we're going to the right direction. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Thank you. Um, one more quick reminder. So the deadline for LF Member Summit, the CFP is open. The deadline's August 30th. So if you're interested in going, if you're interested, so LF Member Summit is an invite only event. So you have to be a corporate member or a member of one of the projects. There's criteria to be able to go. Um, if you get a talk, you get to go no matter who you are. 
So it's a good accessible way to actually get into the LF Member Summit um, is by submitting a talk that gets accepted. So just uh, food for thought. Um, somebody else want to talk about the the next one? I'm not sure who added that. That was me. Um, I saw a post in Slack today that the to-do group's uh, annual OSPO survey is up and live. So I figured I would just put a link to it in the chat or in the agenda for today. It's a good way to make sure the perspective of your open source program office is reflected in one of the big annual surveys. It's a great yeah. source of resources and uh, been a participant through many years. So. Uh, and it didn't take that long. I think I did in about 10 minutes today. So hopefully you folks can join too. Yeah, it's a really good survey if you're part of a if you're part of an OSPO. Um, and they do they do quite a bit of promotion of the results. And so having your your say in there, I think would be would be good. Okay, we're out of time. Look at that. Wow, we went all the way to time. What a yeah. successful instance of the Chaos <laughs> Ospo working group yet again. Gerald, let's not measure it that way. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing that matters is that we fill the time, right? Um, thank it's you, everybody, for joining. Um, it has been a great discussion. We appreciate your engagement, as always. Uh, I've been your host, and we'll see you again next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks, thank everybody. you. Bye. -bye.